I know that there is a word shut up in his bones that is burning like fire, about to be released, about to bless this, the, everybody said in, in a hearing distance of his voice. There is something unusual and uncommon about to take place. I just thank you that you're using him as a vessel of great honor in this time and age we live in. So I just bless him in name above every name in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you. All right. Good morning, church. It's good to see you all. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think mo I know most of you, but uh, for those who are new, my name is Henry. Um, I was born and raised in Germany, but my parents are Chinese. Actually, my mom is here with me for the first time here in Prague. So it's a very special time for me because I get to um, yeah share the word like this um, every few months you know when Pastor John has that so open and this is actually the first time my mom will be seeing me share the word so it's a very special moment for me so I'm very grateful for today yes so uh, we are going to continue the, um, the series on the gospel of John and I actually have the privilege to cover some of the best verses and chapters in this amazing book and when looking over them they are John 14 until the beginning of John 15 and looking through for a theme of what to call this I actually thought that the promises of Jesus was a suitable title for the message that I'm going to share today Last week, um, Pastor John was sharing about um, Jesus uh, in the Passover meal, uh, washing the feet of his disciples. And we ended with basically Jesus telling his disciples, hey, it's my time to go now. I'm going to go now. And his disciples were asking, hey, but how can you leave now? You know, what will we do without you? And there was this real dread um, within the disciples, what are they going to do without Jesus um, being there? Right? So this is where we pick up and this is where Jesus speaks about his promises um, for both the disciples as well as what's to come. So this is where I'm going to pick up. But I'm going to start out with the next slide. Yeah? Oh, it's here. Thank you. I'm going to start with, first of all, <coughs> a good question to all of you, just to get you thinking. And the question is, are you lost? Because if you put yourself in the situation of the disciples at the point, and you know the Savior himself, Jesus Christ, the one person you've been spending the last three years with, and you've seen miracles over and over again, the Son of God, the Messiah, and you've seen it yourself, and suddenly, he is the one who's going to disappear. How would you feel? So just put yourself in the... In the, in the um, feet of the disciples at that point and also for you in your life itself do you in your life right now feel like you have everything in order or do you feel a little bit lost in your life currently in terms of your direction in terms of how you ought to live is there something missing just take a moment and, and, and think about that now the obvious answer is that Jesus is the way. But I want to share a bit with about you some practical points about this. So Jesus himself says that he is God and the only way to God the Father. This is to response of his disciples saying, hey, what are we gonna do without you? Jesus says here in John 14, six to seven, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. He follows this up with saying, don't you believe that I am in the father and that the father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the father living in me who is doing his work. So clearly what is the saying? Jesus says he is the way and the life. So there's no other way to God but through Jesus. Right? When I go out to the streets and I speak to people, I get oftentimes a lot of interesting answers and people will tell me, oh yeah, I kind of believe in God, <coughs> but this Jesus, I think that's just a made up story. When I speak with Muslims, a lot of them are very firm in their faith. They really do believe in God and Allah, right? But again, they don't accept the Jesus part. Jesus is just a prophet. So when we talk about our faith, when we talk about knowing God, 
Jesus is the centerpiece. Without Jesus, we cannot truly know God. So if we want to walk a path towards God, and we want to walk a path <coughs> that is the truth and the life, it cannot go another way outside of Jesus. So the way to know God truly is to know Jesus as the person, right? It's the same and equal. And this is important because we're going to move into, okay, but how do you get to know Jesus? <coughs> In the same chapter, when people, were, uh, the disciples were crying out and they were saying, oh, what are we going to do now? You're going to leave us. <coughs> they felt like orphans. Yeah, they felt like Jesus was abandoning them. Right, so I don't know if you've ever felt like, oh, I'm so lost, I, God hasn't been doing what I've been asking of him, what am I going to do? <coughs> but Jesus says he did not leave us as orphans. And in fact, what happens, even though Jesus in person is leaving, what he is promising is that the situation for the disciples will be even better than before than when Jesus was walking with them. Can you imagine if Jesus was here right now? <coughs> Let's just say, Libor, right now next to you, there's Jesus. Right? You have this assurance, wow, Jesus is right next to me. He knows all the stuff I can ask him. Right? Now, what Jesus is saying is that once I leave, I will send you a helper. And the end result of that Holy Spirit now dwelling in you is going to be even better than if Jesus were right next to you. Because now instead of living next to you, he's living in you. So, <clears throat> when I was thinking about what this means, um, what does it mean to have the Spirit? What does it mean when Jesus promises the Spirit? <coughs> I wanted to highlight a couple points that were mentioned here. So first of all, if you read this verse, John 14, 26, <coughs> but the advocate the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So number one, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is promising you to be a teacher, somebody who keeps in mind. Maybe you fall sometimes, you forget, oh, what am I supposed to do in life? Well, I don't know what direction to go. According to what Jesus said here, he is sending the Holy Spirit so that he will teach you and remind you of all the things that he has taught you. <clears throat> Second, with the Holy Spirit, you receive peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. When you go through the Bible, I don't know how many times exactly, but it says over and over again, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And I was wondering, but Lord, how can I not be afraid? There's many things happening in your life, maybe uncertainty in your job, maybe, I don't know, you have some arguments, financially you're not sure. How can you tell me to not be afraid? Right? Jesus says that I, he leaves the peace with you because he, first of all, he takes care of you. He knows everything about you already in advance before you even know. And one thing you can be sure of that he has the best interest at heart with you. Or the best interest in heart for you? This is how you say in English? Yeah. Well, he has the best thing for you, right? <laughs> like a good father, like we were just saying right now. So that means he doesn't want you to worry because he's already worked it out. But there's a trust part that needs to happen. Because if I don't trust God, I don't actually, I, I will feel afraid because I don't actually trust Him. And I think that's something we need to be honest with each other. Myself, I'm not going to lie and say I have no fear. <coughs> I have fears sometimes for my future. What am I going to do in the future? But it's because I need to remind myself then what did God say concerning this? that it gives me the confidence to then be able to be not afraid anymore and not worry because God said himself that he will take care of it. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. <coughs> Next, through the Holy Spirit, he gives us authority through his name. It says here, don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? 
The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. So again, when we are doing things, for, like praying for people, <coughs> when we are walking our daily lives, you are not just acting on your own authority. When you say, oh, in Jesus' name, I would really challenge you to think again, what does it actually mean before you say that? I don't know, have you ever done this before where you're like, oh yeah, in, in Jesus' name, but you, you feel like for yourself, actually, when you think back about it, it probably didn't mean much to you. Yeah, but God himself, his word, his name has power, has authority. So when you speak the name of Jesus, you need to remember that as well. That there is authority in the name of Jesus. So when I pray, I don't pray in the name of Libor. Which, no offense, no offense, but it's not going to do anything, yeah? But <laughs> when I pray in the name of Jesus, there's something that's going to happen because the name of Jesus carries authority. And that he promises with the Holy Spirit. And then the last is ability. That's what the Holy Spirit gives. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these. Because I am going to the Father. And this is one, if you read it again, that really like kind of blew my mind. Oftentimes as Christians, maybe we think, oh, I'm so helpless. Oh, uh, I don't know. Only God knows. Uh, maybe you are tempted to think that way as well. Or maybe I'm just, I'm just a nobody, you know. This is what the disciples did. This is what Jesus did. But for me, no, it's not possible. Jesus himself says that with the Holy Spirit, you will do even greater things than Jesus did. And Jesus, if you remember, he was not only healing people, he was setting people free. Right? Miracles left, right and center. So how does it look like in your life today? Do you, do you think you're capable of doing that? So, the key thing is, are you able to do that? Because you are not, you yourself, in yourself, are not able to do that. But the ability is part of the package that comes with the Holy Spirit. It's things that he promised through the distribution of the Holy Spirit. Abilities come through with it. You are workers of miracles through that. So think about that. In your life, if you see limitations in your life, <coughs> I can't do that, I can't do that. Think, would Jesus be able to do that through the Holy Spirit? Do I have an illness that the doctor says I will never be able to get rid of? Jesus probably couldn't, would he be able to do, fix that? Right? He would do even greater things. But, I said all these great things about receiving the Spirit and, wow, all the amazing things that come of the Holy Spirit. But the reality is, okay, I'll be quite frank, that in our day-to-day -day lives, you probably can relate in a lot of ways, we don't see as much of those manifestations. I don't always feel like I know everything, or I know about everything. The wisdom that comes from a teacher. I don't always have peace. I don't always feel like I have authority. And I don't always feel like I have the ability to do the things that sometimes God is calling me to. <coughs> but why is that? Is that because the Holy Spirit is not effective? Or is there something else? Right, so I'm going to move on to the next part of this chapter 15 actually, where... God is talking about the vine and the branch. So as you can see in this image, <coughs> the vine is like these grapes, right? And it's attached to the branch. Once you cut off the, the um, sorry, once you cut off the branch, you know, it's no longer going to grow the fruits because it's detached from the source of its life. Right. So what this chapter is all about, I'm going to go through it briefly, is what does, it remain, what does it mean actually to remain in God? And how does that relate to the Holy Spirit that's been given to us? <coughs> and I broke it down into three different parts. <coughs> First of all, why do I need to remain in God? Does anyone have any comment maybe they want to share? Why is it important to remain in God? I thought when you receive the Holy Spirit, oh, I'm a Christian. Okay, that's good. My life, okay, I'm saved. That's it. 
Is that where it ends or is there something more to it? Something more to it. So to start with, why do I need to remain in God? Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But he also says, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burns. This is pretty hard stuff, right? But I wanted to highlight some of these things that are highlighted in yellow. Apart from me, you can do no thing. So if we do not remain in God, all these things that I listed that come with the Holy Spirit, <coughs> you're not going to be able to do. Yes, maybe you have salvation, yes? But this wisdom, the peace, the authority and the abilities that are granted by the Holy Spirit are inaccessible to you anymore because you do not remain in Him. Yeah, you can do no thing, He says, if you are removed from God. Second, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Again, that's why we need to remain in Him. And lastly, he says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. Again, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So, practically speaking, how does it work? Maybe, Libor, again, sorry, I keep <laughs> going back to you. Libor, maybe you have anger management issues. I don't know, hopefully not, yeah? <coughs> or you're super impatient. Yeah. By yourself, you can try all you want, all your life. You'll probably, 20 years later, you'll still have anger management issues. It's, I don't know, many people say, oh, that's just the way I am. It's the way God created me. I have manage anger management issues. For me, it's like, oh, I love eating, so for the rest of my life, I'm just going to eat as much as I can, and I can't help it because, because I love food. Yeah. Okay, maybe bad example. But do we go on with this attitude? Yeah? In it by myself, I cannot change myself. Yeah? If I have problems, if I know there are certain things I'm not supposed to do, if I try to change them by myself, I can't do them by myself. But if I remain in Him, I can bear good fruit, it says. And in the Bible, when it describes good fruit, it's the good fruits of the Spirit, it lists a lot of good characteristics, like patience, like love. Yeah, definitely not anger management issues. Yeah? Yeah? So I'm saying this not to kind of make people feel guilty for having flaws, but to encourage you that, hey, you don't have to remain like this. Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So, number one. You see here, through remaining in Christ, it says, remain in me and my words remain in you. So remembering both his teaching and having this relationship with the Holy Spirit will allow you to bear much fruit. Meaning, fruits of the Spirit, good character, good deeds, love, all of these things, you're able to do them. Yeah? And these are bearing much fruit. And why does God want this? Because it gives Him glory. Because we are disciples of Jesus. And wherever we go, maybe you have friends that are non-believers, yeah? They're going to look at you and they're going to see this is a Christian. And I'm not saying that means you have to be perfect. Okay? I'm just highlighting this, yeah? We are not yet perfect people. But we want to work towards being more godly people because we are ambassadors of Christ. And we want people to see us as disciples of Him. That's the way people see us. You might be the one of the only few Christians that your friends know. This is probably especially true if you're from the Czech Republic. Not many Christians around here. So Lishka, I know, one of the few Christians, Czech Christian girls here. You know? Second, what happens if I remain in God? I have told you this so that, in my, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So what Jesus promises here is if you truly remain in Christ, 
you will have his joy. That means regardless of difficulty, whatever hits you, you will be able to keep that joy. Not meaning that bad things won't happen to you, but even amongst bad situations, you will be able to stand firm. Maybe you have opposition at work. Um, Dina was just sharing with us, maybe there was some, in a Bible study group, that there were some people really like against her at workplace, you know? Or maybe you're struggling financially. Why is it that when I see some people who are really deep in God, they seem to be always somehow smiling, <laughs> unnaturally, almost. There's something that keeps them going, which I can't explain. Because circumstance would dictate that you should be sad. But Jesus himself promises that his joy may be in us, and that our joy may be complete. Meaning that without Christ, actually you cannot have the complete experience and fulfillment of joy. All right, lastly, <coughs> so we went through why do I need to remain in God? Then I just told you now what happens if you do remain in God. <coughs> and now, how to remain in God. So this is a bit tough <coughs> because Jesus is not mincing his words. Yeah? This is one thing I found really intense in this chapter. <coughs> and Jesus says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my com father's commands and remain in his love. So this is quite tough, because to be honest with you, oftentimes this is something we have to be, be sensitive with, because even in your imperfect state, even if you do not follow all his commands, Christ died for you already. So it's already done. Right? In order for somebody to die for you, he needs to probably love you enough to die for you. So regardless of the current state of who you are, Jesus loved us enough to die for us. Even, yeah, especially unbelievers. People that have yet to know him. Yeah? So that's not what I'm saying, but there is a part of us as believers, why should we continue to live a godly life or change things that are not correct? so that we can continue to remain in his presence because God himself he set the laws for a reason but even though we are no longer under those laws you know God delights in us living a godly lifestyle so if you have anger management issues Libor, sorry, don't remain in them don't think oh, oh God lost me anyway so I'm not going to change anything about me no, we are called to ch we are called to evolve as believers. We're not called to just be in one spot and I will be angry all my life and nothing will change until Jesus comes. Through the Holy Spirit we can overcome and we're called to do so to remain in his love, right? Now, second, what else is he saying? What is he commanding us actually in the passage? John 15:12. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, <coughs> to lay down one's life for one's friends. So, he's saying follow my commandments, right? What is the thing that he's saying we should, what his command is in this very chapter, is to love each other. And actually, I think in 13, in the last chapter you were um, preaching about Pastor John, he said the same thing again. I give you a new command, love each other. You know? And you see also in, in the Old Testament, yeah, love, your, love thy neighbor. Even non-believers know that, right? But the question is, but do, you, do, you, do you truly love? Do you truly love? And I, I will get to that in a bit. <laughs> Jesus says he also, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. He says it again. The command is to love each other. <laughs> Which then brings us to the question, do you, do, you, do you love each other? Do you love God? And I'm not here to judge nobody, you know, because this is not what it's about, but I'm here to encourage everybody to reflect in your own life 
if we say we are people of God and God is love and God commands us to love do we love though and how does that look like <coughs> so a couple more <laughs> verses here about what love actually means right I want to go back to what Jesus said himself <coughs> to love is to lay down one's life for one's friends that's the greatest love so what does that mean actually essentially it's can somebody tell me what if you translate that what would that be called what kind of love Ah, sacrificial love sacrificial love and what did God do in action to show his love for us sorry sacrifice his life on the cross so the Lord that we follow Jesus he took his words into action and he died for us bearing our sins to show the love that he has for us the biggest the biggest event or the biggest show of love of all time and this is how I know that my God and our God is love because he's shown it through actions he's not just talking about it he brought the biggest sacrifice so how does that relate to us in our lives you know are you showing sacrificial love towards your brothers and sisters Hmm? How do you show love to your brothers and sisters? Can somebody? Ah, forgiving? Yeah, forgiveness. Wow. That's big time. Anybody else? Serving? Okay. Serving like in people or like the church? Yeah, okay. Cool. Anyone else? One more? Giving by faith. Giving by faith. Yes, awesome. Being patient with people. Oh, that's very important. It's hard to come by these days, eh? Patience. <laughs> Especially in our generation. <laughs> okay? So, you heard some examples of sacrificial love, right? And one thing I really want to hanker down here is, in your own life, are you doing things only that, you are, that are convenient for you? Or are you also trying to do things that are maybe not convenient for you? And what is it, if there's a sacrifice involved in the action that you need to do, I believe that is an action of true love. Because it costs you something. It costs God to bring salvation. It costs his very own son's death for there to be salvation. Right? So there's a huge cost involved in that. So as we, I, what I want to say is that as we are talking about love right now, in our own lives, what are the things that you are doing for the people around you that involves a certain sacrifice? And are you willing to take that sacrifice to showcase the love towards that person? Right? Maybe your friend, you're so busy. Your friend is in need, but you're like, ah, but I'm so busy. You taking your time, even though you don't have time, to go there and listen to her and help her, whatever, is a sacrifice on your part to show her your love. Right? But for example, if, and again, I'm not downplaying services that people do, but if, for example, somebody asks, oh, can you help me? And you, oh, I have time now, so I'm going to go there. You know, it's out of convenience and maybe out of time that you have, that you're spending, that you're serving. So that's fine, you're serving, right? But maybe sacrifice less. So what I want to do is to encourage you, think about things in your life that you can do for someone even if it means you have to give up something. And that really shows love towards each other. Maybe you have to work extra hard to help this person. Yeah? You have to make time, make time to make that happen. That shows love. This is to people. Now the question is to God. How do we show the love? <coughs> he says over and over again, if you love me, keep my commands. John 14, 15. He continues, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. I'm sorry, this is from the Bible, but this is really hard. 
Yeah. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my father's commands and remain in his love. And lastly, my command is this, love each other as I've loved you. Again, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. So, this is another reminder. Why, as believers, when we receive the grace of God, and God loves us, and receives us into his kingdom, that's what he died for, right? The way that we are. But after we have received him, I think it is also so, so crucial to show thankfulness and gratefulness for that sacrifice by showing love to God himself. His love is unconditional because he's already done it for us. But he's calling us to obey his commands as an act of love towards him. Right? So if you're seeing something or anything that I said today that's convicting for you, you know, go home, pray about it. Lord, how can I show more love towards you? You know, not that you will love me more as a result of that, but if somebody loves, shows love towards you, you should also, if you love that person, show love to them and not take them for granted. For those that are married, You'll probably want to do things to please your wife or your husband, right? So why is it when we have a relationship with God, we sometimes maybe are not so interested to, to do things that please Him? You know, are these things that are also in our minds as well as we go all our lives? You know, we go to study, we go to work. You know, we go through our lives, we go through trouble and we go, Father, help me, help me. Lord, I need this and this. And the Lord provides. And we are thankful. But then maybe after that period of time, suddenly we forget about him anymore. So what I want to challenge with you guys are, is, are the interests of the Lord in your mind, are they something that's, that's worrying? Is there something that's on your mind consistently? Father, how can I please you? With both the way that I act my life, with the way that I love my, my friends, my, not actually not just friends, but strangers, yeah? Are my actions, the things that I'm doing in my reflective of, of you? Because Lord, I want to serve you. I want to please you. Not that I have to do that in order to, to receive your love, but I want to show you love. That's why I'm doing it. Right? So just to summarize again, the things I was saying, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If we want to know God and have a living, breathing relationship with Him, we need to go and seek Jesus. In order to seek Jesus, we need to make time for Jesus. You need to actually want to spend time with God. Whether it's in prayer, whether it's reading the Word, whether it's serving Him, and something needs to be in your mind if you're actually interested in that. You know? And God says, He promised the Holy Spirit and He's given it to each and every one of us that has received Christ as their Lord and Savior. That Holy Spirit dwells in you now. That means you have a teacher. You have peace that's given by God. You have authority in His name. And you have ability that surpasses your human limitations because of the Holy Spirit that now dwells in you. But you need to remain in Him. You need to remain in Him to be able to bear the good fruit that He's made for you to bear. Let's love the Lord with all our heart, not just in word as we sing, but through action. Being intentionally doing the things that please Him by spending time with Him. Let's not just sing empty words to God saying that we love Him. Yeah? This is an encouragement, guys. This is not a condemnation. Because I realize for myself, I'm not spending enough time yet with the Lord. There's many things I haven't seen yet. But the Bible says that I can do even greater things than this. The greater things. So I just want to close in prayer. <clears throat> 
and then maybe Miranda, if we still have a little bit of time, could you sing the um, the wine um, new wine song again? <coughs> Father, thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice for for us, Lord Jesus. That you loved us even though we were sinners, Father. That you died for us even though we were not living up to what you've called us to, Lord. Thank you, Father. That you set an example how to live. God, and that you've even made that the impossible possible through your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, that now dwells in us, Father. God, my cry right now is just for us to continue to seek you desperately, Lord Jesus. Father, in our lives, that, you, that we will never be too busy for you, Lord Jesus. But even, you know, as we sing these songs about you being the center of our lives, Father, I pray that that will be the reality of our lives, that you indeed will be at the center of our lives, Father. That we want to do things, Father. And I pray right now, God, help me to have a more desire to want to love you, Father. Help us to have a more desire to want to serve you. To think about the things that will please you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness, Lord Jesus. That even in our imperfect state, Father, you're willing to work with us and use us, Father. And Father, we should surrender our lives to you again. Saying, God, here we are. This is what we have. Make new wine out of me. Change that heart. Maybe you felt for a while that your heart has been hardened that you don't hear God anymore that you're not interested in God anymore pray right now in your heart Lord change my heart make new wine out of my heart so that I can bear good fruit and can have life and life in its fullest Lord let's sing this last song in Jesus name Before we close, I thought I might make a firm declaration that Libor really does not have an anger management problem. <laughs> but I, I want to bless you with an encouraging thought that I was thinking about with this great message Henry shared. Thank you, Henry. <clears throat> Most of you probably don't struggle with big commands. I mean, maybe someone struggles with keeping the Sabbath keeping it holy but most of the time I'm not looking at a group of people who are struggling with not wanting to go kill again tomorrow or steal again tomorrow or something like that um, but we do struggle with things like anger and lust and fear and things that we don't want part of our life and we struggle and we struggle one of my life metaphors is I, I ask people to, to look at this beautiful floor. See that parquet floor? Now, while you're looking at the floor, describe the ceiling to me. No, you got to look at the floor, Henry. No cheating. And the point is, the enemy would like to have us looking at our sin and your brother's sin and your sister's sin and we're all focusing on this sin stuff and when we're focusing on that we're not focusing on God and I want to encourage you today that part of that wrong focus is our struggles sometimes we just think about that too much and you know you're not going to power your way through it you may think you're going to power your way through it, but you're just going to struggle and struggle and struggle. And Henry, he opened up the secret to change, is to abide in Christ. And then, somehow, the Holy Spirit changes you from the inside out. Your appetites change, your desires change, and eventually 
your behaviors change. And it wasn't even hard. So if you want to try hard at something, try hard at connecting with God. Try hard abiding in Christ. Put your efforts where there's going to be benefits. Because what Jesus has promised is that we do that, we will bear good fruit. So Father, thank you for today and this uh, great message. Thank you for your word to encourage us. I for one am encouraged today. And I want to speak a, a blessing over everyone here today that they would walk out here of here uh, holding uh, within their heart uh, the deep love of God the Father and the amazing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the abiding fellowship of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen.